the topic. So a couple of weeks ago, I went onto eBay and I had the winning bid on a slide rule. Try to contain your excitement. <laughs> Many of you probably have never seen a slide rule or used one, even at Drexel. So I'm going to explain to you how a slide rule works and what I like about it. So one thing you'll notice is it's made of wood. And by the way, you use a slide rule to do math calculations. So you can multiply, divide, do logarithms, sines, cosines, any number of things that uh, just traditionally people used to do with a piece of wood. So to multiply, slide the one until it lines up with the two. Slide the slide to the number you want to multiply by two. In this case, it's two. And the answer is four. Now I know what you're thinking. I knew that. But you can do more comp complex numbers, of course. Right? So one of the things I like about the slide rule is what you see in front of you when you pick up a slide rule is every number you can possibly think of in the universe. Right here, written on this piece of wood. Not only that, it's graphically beautiful, and it will show you logs and exponentials, etc. if you're interested and if you really want to see these things play out. Compare that to a calculator, where when you pick it up, it shows you nothing, and when it turns on, it shows you a zero. Or to an Excel spreadsheet, which is a vast wasteland of nothingness <laughs> and despair. <laughs> OK, here's a problem that I felt was going on in my math class. Here are two equations, the same equation. Now, in both cases, the answers are wrong. Right? The answer should, of course, be 73. But if my answer was the one on the left, 72, I'm only off by one. If the kid next to me says 63, he's off by 10. He is 10 times as dumb as I am. <laughs> Yet we got the same grade, and that made no sense to me. Which leads me to this. My feeling on math is that while numbers are digital, math is analog. And this point was not lost on Pythagoras, who was horribly obsessed with the triangle, but that was not his only obsession. So you probably know Pythagoras from this. The Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Right? Familiar to everyone? Any engineering students out there? Yeah? OK. All right, so you've seen this before. OK, so this is the way I was taught the Pythagorean theorem. In, in school, right? There's a, a triangle with an A and a B and a C and a little two and a little two over the B and a little two over the C. It dawned on me many, many, many years later that this is what Pythagoras was thinking. That if you draw a square around the two, uh, the, around the A and draw a square around the B and then draw a square around the C, now, that may not shatter your world, but someone when I was in school could have mentioned it. <laughs> and this works, this works with every triangle, every right triangle you can think of, right? Someone could have brought it up. It was many, many years after I figured this out that I read Ed Tufte's book and saw that other interesting things also happened with the right triangle. So for instance, if you dissect it perfectly, B equals B and A equals A. Kind of interesting properties. Not lost on Pythagoras, but certainly lost on my math class. Pythagoras also did some other things that I was not informed about. He developed the musical scale. Pythagoras felt that the universe, the gods, the heavens, the planets, music, physics, the world, is all in harmony. And he wasn't as obsessed with the triangle as he was with trying to understand harmony in nature. And mathematics was part of that exploration. Now, to show you how tightly tied religion is to these physical properties of the world and mathematics, if you look up top, 
you'll notice that God is tuning his guitar. Pythagoras has God as a roadie. <laughs> Even better, Pythagoras was the leader of a cult called the Pythagorean Brotherhood, and they believed in many bizarre, bizarre things and practices. Now, I was in high school in the 60s. <laughs> I can't relate to cults. This is something else that someone could have mentioned. A final thing I learned about Pythagoras, he died an early death. He was killed by an angry mob who did not agree with his views on math and religion. I can relate to that also. I think my entire ninth grade math class also wanted to kill Pythagoras for having to memorize a stupid theorem. Okay, so here's what Pythagoras uh, figured out, that if you take a vibrating string and you shorten it, either with a slide or with your fingers and frets on a fretboard, the sound will get higher, and if you go the other direction, the sound will get lower, and that works no matter what note that guitar is tuned to, that instrument is tuned to. Uh, there are also some perfect proportions. If you divide it by one-third and two-thirds and you play the two-thirds part, what you're getting is a perfect fifth harmonic. If you play guitar, that's on the seventh fret. So there are these perfect proportions in math and music and physics that Pythagoras was exploring. Who can tell me what this is? Okay, sheet music is better. If you said music, that's entirely wrong. My description of this is a blight on society. This is the worst example of information design that we have been saddled with for more than 500 years. This is a god-awful system developed by monks in the 1500s. 1,500 years, no, sorry, 2,000 years after Pythagoras, this system of musical notation was developed. Who learned the musical scale this way? Like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Did anyone ever ask why it starts on the letter C? <coughs> anyone know? Raise your hand if you know. These are such basic questions. <laughs> if you play A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you are playing in the key of A minor. And when this musical notation system was introduced, A minor was the somber key that you would hear in church, or at funerals, or some Motown. <laughs> but this is a problem with the system. We have four octaves here on the musical scale. Those four, those four octaves embody 48 notes. Those 48 notes need to exist in 28 spaces. No matter how you do the math, that doesn't divide. Who can tell me what this is? Well, these are notes that don't exist. These are stumbling blocks, booby traps in the musical scale. There's no such thing as a E sharp or a B sharp. Well, there's no such thing as a uh, F flat, right, or a C flat. Now, if you really study music, you can say, oh yeah, there's a E sharp, it's F. But that's the point. Monks didn't have that problem. They were playing in the minor key, usually A minor key, and they didn't have to notice there are no sharps and flats here. The monks had it easy for themselves. What they ended up doing is strapping us with this god-awful system that we mistake for music. Okay, whoever looked at a piano keyboard and thought, hey, look, a couple of notes are missing. Anyone? Okay, the acoustic space between any two adjoining notes are actually the same. So there are actually no notes missing. There are 12 notes in the musical scale. They're all spaced evenly, acoustically spaced evenly. So if you look at a guitar fretboard, of course, you'll notice there are no missing frets, right? But in a piano, it's a bit of an optical illusion. It, you get the appearance. And because of that, transposing, playing in the key of C is much different than 
playing in the key of C sharp or the key of D. You really have to rethink some things if you're going to do that if you're playing piano. Now, this is Irving Berlin. Irving Berlin is a great American composer. He wrote things like Alexander's Ragtime Bands. He wrote um, Putting on the Ritz. He wrote God Bless America. This is a very early photo, and if you look to where Irving's fingers are, you'll see he's on the black keys. Irving Berlin only played piano in one key, and that was the key of F sharp. When you play in the key of F sharp, you play all five black keys. You also play the two blue keys that I'm showing here. Irving Berlin had a piano that had a lever underneath that would literally lift up the keyboard and shift it over one string at a time. So while he only played in the key of F sharp, his piano could translate that to any key. This is Amazing Grace in the key of G. This is an alternative way, which you'll see on the bottom are six lines. This is called tablature. Guitar players use this. It's one line per string, and it'll sh those numbers show you which fret to play on. But I'm going to talk about a system developed in Nashville, which gets away from letters and uses numbers. 1141, 1155. The system was developed by Neil Matthews of the Jordanaires. The Jordanaires were backup singers for people like Elvis Presley, but lots of other country singers. This was further developed by uh, Charlie McCoy, who is still down in Nashville playing away. But a session player goes back to the 1960s. And here's what they did. Rather than look at C, D, E, F, G, A, B, what they thought about was the relative distance between notes, and they just used numbers. And I'll show you here in the key of C, if you play the 1, 4, and 5 chord, you get C, F, and G. This is what this means. This is musical notation that does not have a key. Right? 1141 one, one means something in the key of C, but 1141 one, one means something different in the key of D. And that means when the Jordanaires or anyone was, was playing the same song with different singers, they only needed one arrangement. This is a keyless system. OK. What is my point? A question that I am asking myself at this very second. OK, so you go back like 2,500 years. We got Pythagoras thinking of art, music, math, the universe, embodying it all at once. What's happened since that time, though, is our education system has kind of gone that way or that way. We either get channeled into like music or art, or we get channeled into things like math and science. It's a left brain, right brain thing. But you don't have a left brain and a right brain. You have a left half and you have a right half. So if you ever speak to someone and they say, oh, I'm a right brain person, or I'm a left brain person, what you should be thinking to yourself inside is I am talking to a half brain person. <laughs> OK, back to the slide rule. If you look at a slide rule and you compare that to a slide guitar, you'll notice probably more similarities than you would think. Here's my recommendation. Skip math class and music class. Go on eBay, buy a slide reel and a slide guitar, and learn them both at the same time. If you're really ambitious, move to Nashville, put a band together, write all your musical arrangements using numbers, not letters, and see if he could talk the drummer into putting a picture of Pythagoras on his bass drum head. <laughs> Thanks a lot.